Okay, welcome to Spine Conference. Today's discussion is uh, cervical radiculopathy. And um, if anybody has any questions or comments during the uh, conference, please feel free to interrupt. So uh, this is the illustrative case, 55 year old woman who presented uh, to my office, a uh, friend of a friend, uh, has a one week history of severe uh, right arm pain. So um, who should, um, who should, what, what uh, questions would you ask? Look, uh, this is a resident, uh, Dr. Ocean Smart. What, what questions, pa patient says, my right arm hurts. She made it to your office because a friend of a friend. Sure. Uh, so you can start by asking where her pain is located. Um, does it radiate? Okay, I always ask people to point with their index finger because I think it's, it's right. a little clear. Right. It starts on the right part of her neck and she says it runs down her lateral arm, radial forearm, okay. into her thumb and index finger. Okay. Uh, does she have any kind of motor symptoms as well? Uh, uh, just she, she says uh, it's like generalized uh, weakness. Okay. Any radiation after treatment? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> does she have any kind of motor symptoms as well? Yeah. The past medical history is uh, she had a carpal tunnel release on the same side. Okay and her symptoms uh, of numbness in her hand never got better. So she said chronic carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, so we said uh, first lots of her forearm and then in terms of her hand forcing thumb, thumb index uh, fingers, okay. she doesn't really say much of the hand. Okay, um, and then any issues uh, in terms of fine motor skills? Um, uh, none really. But she has pain. It's hard to it's hard to interpret. So that so that question is more like um, a st cervical stenosis um, question. This is more like an acute okay. an acute so presentation. No, no. So it's basically let me let me keep let me keep moving. So how would so um, on physical exam she has no motor deficit, but she has obvious uh, uh, pain when she moves her neck. And um, does anybody know what a Sperling's maneuver is? What is it? So you basically uh, extend the neck, uh, you rotate towards the affected side, and you laterally bend, and then you put some extra axial pressure. You tend to hold, you can hold it for quite a while. You know, you should try to hold it for at least like a minute, is what Dr. used to say. And if it reproduces the pain, you know, that shooting pain down the lateral aspect of her arm, down to the uh, fingertips of the thumb index, and uh, middle finger, it's a positive spurling to Okay. Is that right? I forget. The Sperling's is rotate towards the side and bend, I thought. But anyway, so... Um, shoulder, it, shoulder, shoulder. Yeah. I forget, but uh, I mean, Sperling's maneuver was first. I looked it up. It was OBGYN, like 1950, um, or like OBGYN general surgery articles it was from the 1950s. But um, uh, she does have symptoms that are recreated with range of motion of her neck is a basic uh, premise. And uh, what would be your uh, initial uh, treatment options? So, uh, in terms of that, well, let's look at the x-ray first. What do you see on the x-ray? <laughs> um, so we have an HD lateral here, so spine. Uh, there's just some degenerative changes. I see maybe some lumps of this kind at... Uh, this one? Yeah. C5, C6? Mm-hmm. Uh, which... I guess that's sort of pathology is is consistent with her physical exam potentially. What, what do you think? What's the, what is it, what does that say to you when she has a chronic carpal tunnel um, the syndrome that didn't improve with surgery? That most likely there's some sort of mechanism in the neck that she's really trying to reverse the problem So so uh, why why didn't the um, why didn't the uh, hand surgeon send it to the spine surgeon but rather did hand surgery? I don't know the true answer, but I'm just. Yeah, I don't know. Do you, uh, have you ever seen that before? I mean, I mean right yeah, now. So the EMG would help. Yeah. What do you think, Paul? What, I I have a I have an idea of what I think happened, but what do you think? Well, why is that? Why did the hand surgery have a double crush? This may have had positive carpal canal compression signs and and uh, felt that it was kind of typical of the median nerve distribution and and did. I think most I think most hand surgeons would get EMGs. I don't think they, they would they might they would they might inject with some cortisone, some cortisone and think it's better maybe to do the procedure, but I think most of them would get 
EMG, especially if they have anything in the in the you know shoulder. I know, okay. and it might be different. The symptoms might have been different. That's what I was going to get to. It probably was mild to begin with. Mild, it, right? It, or, it, or she did have symptomatic carpal tunnel at that point, but then had a, a double crush. Her cervical symptoms maybe were mild uh, uh, a year ago, and also she probably maybe had some mild carpal tunnel syndrome. So it's a common um, it's a common complaint. Um, Let me ask a question for Brian. Now. Yeah. What is a classic position for somebody, if you see them, like, just like you know, we talk about sciatica, that a patient comes in and they're kind of sitting like this when you know they're having pain in their leg and it's a kind of weight their sciatic nerve. What is a classic position that a person will put their arm in that if you see them walking, you walk in and they have their arm in that position, you, you right away you know they've got a cervical radiculopathy. Which, which position takes tension off the nerve root? I imagine their, their neck would be flexed with their arms uh, flexed in front of them, kind of punched over. That, okay, one them. position would sometimes be they'll be holding their arm up like this. What's the more? What's another position? You know, Katie? Right. You see a patient who walks in like this, right away at cerebral radiculopathy, right? I mean, that's classic, all right? Almost pathomonic. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so uh, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, cartoon on the right, you can kind of maybe understand like putting your arm over your head will, will make it more slack. I don't know if that helps. So it's very common. And the other thing is sling. People do show up in the office with sling sometimes. Um, those people worry me because... Um, I feel those people are on their way to RSD or, you know, complex visual pain, but they don't move their arm, they don't shake your hand. I don't like that. Well, it's certainly more apt to get a frozen shoulder. That's why you have to be careful, you know, with those people who are not moving their arms. Okay, so what are you, um, so Messon, what would you do with this patient? Uh, she's a friend of a friend. She saw, she's a one week history of right C6 radiculopathy symptoms. What would you do with her? Physical therapy and any medicines? What's your what's your what's your routine? What's your routine? Uh, I'll put them on whatever anti-inflammatory works for them. So I'll ask them what's worked for you in the past. If you've got diabetes, etc. Some will say loxicam, some will say I love weed, or something like that. So I'll uh, I'll let them decide, and I'll send them to a therapy with some traction. Okay, so go ahead. I'll I'll tell you. You know, a nurse surgeon once told me, an old nurse surgeon, a trick. He said what he would do is. Um, was this was Dr. Slaughter. Slaughter, okay. Ter terrible name for a neurosurgeon. He's a good guy. No, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Good. And what he would do is, uh, he's in the middle of the back, I put him a soft thermal collar with the Velcro in the front, so it tilts the head down a little bit, and just give him a week. Just to rest that neck, rest the neck. And very often, that will knock out the inflammation if there's an acute, ridiculous symptom. So, Medrol, flex, and you send them to, for therapy for their traction to open up the frame. And that's what I typically do for a patient who's got a cuboradiculopathy. Okay, I usually do steroids followed by meloxicam, physical therapy, and I usually give them a muscle relaxer so they can sleep at night. And even gabapentin or, or Lyrica sometimes will also help to make the nerve less. Do you do that as a first line? Uh, I, it depends on how bad they're hurting sometimes. So yeah. if they're really bad, what do you do? Yeah, I do gabapentin and medrol. Medjol and gabapentin, yeah. not no non-steroidal, and right. follow up only. Followed by med, by by non like you say, after you finish the medjol, I would do. Start with non-steroidal, okay. And when would you have them back? I'm just curious. I'm learning from you guys. I typically see about three weeks. If it's okay. really bad, um, mm -hmm. or or I would call me in three weeks. If not any better after that regimen, then I'd order an MRI and see you back after an MRI. So call them if they're not doing well, they get the MRI. Yeah. How about you, um, Mesfin? What's your? You know, if, if there's so much variability. The, there's a patient that comes in with arm abducted who's, who's had some treatment. That's who this patient is. This is yeah, the patient in the dying. Yeah. That person will kind of keep a closer eye on her. This person's dying, but she's had no treatment. It's been a week. No treatment. Yeah, so if she's dying, like, they'll probably see her as opposed to someone who's like, I got a little three weeks, four weeks. Okay. And, and as opposed to the person who comes in and says, I got a little tingling in my hand, so we're kind of like six weeks. So three weeks, and uh, would you MRI or no MRI? Okay. Yeah. So. No, no red flags. Um, usually, I give people the referral for the MRI and say, if you don't get better, get the MRI. If you feel fine, don't call me again. So they don't. The the office is not inundated with phone calls. 
So, oh yeah, what's this? Um, who can tell me what this thing is? Is that normal? Does everybody have that? What is it? See that? Well, okay, how about I ask another question? Somebody knows this. What, what's in that hole? What lives in that hole? Is it the aortic artery? Is it the C0 nerve root? You got I me. Mean, I, no way. Someone, um, she knows this. What is it? So I think that I think the vertebral artery is there, and I just think it's an anomaly. Why didn't you say something? Well, I did that. <laughs> All right, it's a vertebral artery. Does anybody know what it's called? Does it? I saw the next slide. Arcuate I had to look up arcuate. It just means it means bending, and uh, it's just an anomaly. But she's got it. Uh, it has a bony arch. And just for anatomy purposes, since we're on vertebral artery. Um, the vertebral artery goes over the arch of the atlas, so you can injure this. Big problem if you injure it. Um, and it's, I, I always thought it was like 15, 18 millimeters or so from the uh, midline. Do you guys agree with that? About the ballpark. So, um, medications we talked about physical therapy, cervical traction. Paul, do you ever send them home with physical, uh, cervical traction? You just let physical therapy take care of that. The physical therapy, and they say I'm getting better. Then the therapist will sometimes get them. I'll give them a home traction unit sometimes. You prescribe it? Yeah. Okay. okay so, um, They're different types. Here are the obliques uh, left oblique, right oblique. Um, so, um, who, who, uh, who was it? Ocean. Uh, so, this is the left oblique here? Yeah, what's this thing here? So, that, that's looking at just the left side. So this is left, you see the L, this is right, she's right side symptoms. So what do you think of the right foramina? They look pretty good, right? If she had an indentation here of white stuff, what would that be? Yeah, ostomite emanating from what? Joint, yeah, no, an opposite joint from, from here in. So, yeah, uncle vertebral joint, also called the joint of L... Lushka. Okay. And um, so just as a review, the foramens, and uh, this would be the joint of Lushka. And then you could also have compression of the nerve root from the facet. Um, so here's um, what it would look like if they had an osteophyte of the joint of Lushka. But also, people could have posterior stenosis too from the facet joint. So it's, it's very important to know if you're a surgeon where the problem is. Otherwise, you'll never fix the problem. So you have to be sure of where the problem is coming from. It can be either one. And um, typically, the uncus looks like a goalpost. Paul Dorian taught me that 25 years ago. And uh, like the bottom one's hands up and the other one sits inside. But then when it becomes an ossified, it just both sides has like a sort of like a kissing lesion. And it can compress the nerve. You can see that. And then directly posterior is the facet. You can see how that can compress you too. So same here, the osseous, the joint of Lushka, and then the facet on the other side. So if you if you have facet hypertrophy, which is the predominant stenosis, will an anterior approach fix that? What do you guys think? Frank, what do you think? If you have facet hypertrophy, will an anterior approach remove the stenosis? Yes. In general, no, right? Yeah, yeah so you, you have to know where it's coming from. Okay, six weeks... Later, patients know better. So um, she got an MRI scan. Mm -hmm. So um, here's the MRI. I'll, um, Samir's not here. Who can, Stephanie, what's that thing right there? I'm asking you because you answered the last question. Katie, 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 Katie. Sorry, sorry. I don't know why I call you Stephanie. No, good. Okay. Perfect timing. Dr. Sexton, Dr. Sexton just joined. So. Okay. Katie, what do you think that circle is? I'm sorry, I called you yeah, something. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I'm looking for people are. Okay. And um, what do you think? Uh, someone else uh, go over. Um, um, okay, we'll ask them a difficult question. But somebody go over the MRI scan. Um, who can? Here you have uh, mid okay. cut, um, uh, the cube. Um, you're seeing that there's some mild central canal stenosis um, as, as you move this way from C5 to C6. Nothing compressive, no myeloma, Um 
so you're seeing some new generative changes, but uh, primarily. Is the canal, here's the spinal cord, right, in the middle? Is the canal normal size, small size, big size? How would you describe it? Maybe a little narrow, maybe a little narrow, but I don't think it's striking. So. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, so the, you said, did you say the bulging disc at C5, C6? Yeah, the generic changes, the disc bulges are kind of narrowed the canal slightly, but not to a simple size. So she has C6 radiculopathy. Would that correspond to C5, C6? C6 uh, radiculopathy? Okay, what do you think of this view? Uh, so that that disposal looks a little bit more prominent in that particular. It's thing. more often. So it looks like maybe this versus maybe a little cyst there. What's that thing? A little. So I think a little cyst, maybe a little cyst in the joint. Okay, it's not a cyst. No. Anybody else want to make a comment? They think that's in the lumbar spine. What would the lumbar be? I would think that it's probably superior migration of the cyst. So why isn't it the same thing in the cervical spine? Yes, it is. <laughs> and why is the color different? Um, the color is different. I mean, it may be just a free fragment that is surrounded in fluid rather than just. <laughs> um, otherwise, I don't know. Anybody else want to comment? Why is the color different? Maybe. I mean, what what makes it bright? What makes what makes it bright? Fluid. Yeah. So why would this part of the disc have not fluid, but like water? Why would this one have like Maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So what what part of the disc is black? Like really black? Yeah. And what part of the disc would be really bright? So so how would you think what would this be then? Maybe. You know, we don't know, but we're just guessing. Yeah, exactly. And intraoperatively, that's exactly what it was. I, I fished it out with a nerve hook and it was a really soft hydrophilic piece. It wasn't like a thick annular fibrosis piece, which is different, very hard. Um, okay, do, anything, uh, Mestrin or Paul, do you want to add to that? Okay, so, um, okay, someone else. Um, okay. Here we have a right. Grant, uh, Grant, Grant. Grant. I'm, I'm blanking on names today, okay, demented, go ahead. Um, we have two axo cuts, C-spine MRI, mm -hmm. um, we're at, so on that left cut, we're at two, three, four, five, it looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see a decent amount of fluid around the cord, also used to nurses at that level. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next cut, we're at two, three, four. These are all the same level. Same I did it on purpose. Okay, and then you have a difference. Okay, what's this, what's this circle? Do you care what the circle is? That is our retrieval frame. And why do, as a spine surgeon, why do I know, want to know where it is? That's the spinal line all out. Yeah. Yeah, so you want to know where not to go. It's like it's very important what not to do, you know? Um, I, might, uh, Stru, I might just say that the image on the left is a gradient echo scan, and uh, like, we, like we recognize in imaging, the thinner the section, um, the better detail you can see of the anatomy, but the noisier the uh, image is. So the image on the axial image on our left is thin and noisier, the one on our right is a little thicker and a little less noisy. Uh, I, I tend to use them both, but I, I must say that I lean more heavily on the T2-wave scan, which is on our right. Okay, wh wh what, what's the benefit of the noisy one? Uh, that, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing uh, uh, super well. The, the one on the left uh, is, is uh, very thin and therefore um, potentially oh, can um, look at small parts of the anatomy better, uh, but you do sacrifice the, the noise. So I, I agree. Uh, it, it, it depends sort of patient to patient, pathology to pathology, which of the two acquisitions is more helpful. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're just uh, going down. And Dr. Carlton, just chime in whenever you want to speak because um, out of sight, out of okay. mind, I forget, you're kind of like God. We just hear your voice. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, um, okay, um, Grant, so we're going down a little bit in millimeters. What do you think here? Anything different? What's the beginning of this black thing right here? What can this be? It's black. It's on. It's right near the framing. What would be black near the framing? Huh? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think so. So going down there, this is behind, this is at what level would you say? What's this thing here, Grant? That this thing here, this structure, can you see that? It goes from the posterior elements to the anterior body. Yeah, so it's at the level of the pedicle. We're going farther down. Now this is anything you see here? What's this, is this anything or no? Start to see that superior aspect of that disc fragment that's herniated superiorly. Mm -hmm. And here? And that looks like it's the um, the posterior portion of the anus that's herniated upwards from the uh, plastic. Bulb. We said nucleus pulposus. That's nucleus what you pulposus. meant to say that. Yeah. And it does look asymmetric. So we're going farther now. What do you think? The right side. The disc material, huh? I think this is not a disc bulge, but rather I think this is like a sequestered fragment because it's bright, it's nucleus pulposus, right? Do you agree with that? Uh, anything you want to add, Dr. Sexton? Um, yeah, these are these are wonderful images of this disc herniation. Um, um, just to emphasize to people who are not look, have not looked at a lot of MRI, we really we key on the cord and we key on the CSF around the cord. So uh, you should focus on those two on every slice. And so you can see the cord is a little tilted, but even more, the uh, the fecal sac and the CSF around the cord is effaced right ventrally. Uh, and I also look for the little root sleeve on the left. You can see a little point as it starts out the foramen. Um, uh, yeah, just, yeah. And on the right, of course, you don't see anything like that at all. So. Everything points to there being something significant, extradural, uh, on the right, uh, ventral, uh, just ma matching up with that disc on the sagittals. And who, who can tell me what anatomical landmarks in the frame and that's exquisitely painful that would describe why this patient has severe pain? Yeah, those were ganglion, yeah. So it, it makes sense, right? So more grant, anything okay. different here? Like it's pretty much resolved below that. Hey, Dr. Sexton, you there? What is, I am. What is this black thing here on either side of the spinal cord that you see? Um, I, what, um, we usually attribute low signal in the fecal sac that we can't explain by any other means as uh, CSF flow. Um, and uh, I, I don't. I feel a little shaky about that. It's a great question. They're, they're, they're clearly not nerve roots like you see in the lumbar spine um, running cephalocaudal. They don't do that in the cervical, as you know. I'm guessing um, well, it's a CSF flow phenomenon. Remember that CSF pulsates. So what, that's like a current that you find in a river? Does CSF like flowing fast? Yeah, that's exactly right. Huh, that's fascinating. So, so why wouldn't it be brighter on T2 then? Why would, why would it be dark if it's, uh, I mean, if it's more fluid why would it why you know why would it be why, why is it dark why is it dark well i'm always on thin ice with mr physics but um when things are moving um they tend to um they they, they move out of the slice and don't give back their signal so it's the same reason that arteries are black and um and veins um, are variable and csf is variable because of the speed of the flow uh, it's, it has to do with motion rather than uh, that they're lifting. Well, where, where, where's the other areas that you see this in the CSF, typically? I'm sorry, say again? Can you, can you also tell us other areas we would see this in the cervical CSF? Other time, like examples? Well, at, at the thoracic spine is actually the where we commonly run into this as a, a potential problem because um, I, I don't know why the flow... Uh, is, is greater there in the MRI portrayal of the flow is greater in the thoracic, but you'll see things that look um, darkish all up and down in the thoracic canal on the T2. Um, you, you don't see it as much maybe because there just isn't as much CSF around the cord in the cervical. Okay, I think, uh, so this I think is a, a cartoon diagram which would best uh, um, uh, uh, portray what we have today. And this is not really what she has. She has a soft disc because the foramen looked okay on the x-ray. Uh, and what a C6 palsy would be what, um, Brian? 
features told me would be uh, wrist extension and elbow flexion. Wrist uh, C6, yeah, wrist, you said wrist extension and, yeah, and some elbow flexion, right? Because C, uh, biceps is all, uh, elbow flexion is not only C6, but also C5, Five. Five, yeah. And uh, so just um, C6 palsy would be wrist extension. And this, everyone should have this memorized. I look at it all the time. Um, and we discussed this. So let's say you're gonna do a surgery. Um, the anterior approach, everybody knows this, Smith-Robinson, sternocleidomastoid, carotid sheath, which you protect, and then the disc and uh, medial is the trachea, esophagus, discectomy. And then the options are, what are the options, uh, James, for anterior approach? Uh, just for surgery. Yeah. After this, after you do a decompression, what are the options? Yeah. And then fusion options, what are the options, fusion options? To stick in the defect. Peak. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the anterior uh, plate, usually titanium. Mm -hmm. So who can who, who does anyone know Hillebrand's uh, article uh, about adjacent segment generation after fusion? Does anyone know that article or that somebody told me this already? Who does know this article, Ray James? Everybody in this room should know this article. This is one of the articles you should have know. It's classic. Brian got a few articles that's at level one evidence. And on adjacent segment generation. Everybody should have this article and know this article. It's on every test. Brian Gallagher told me the article. So, uh, well, Brian, what's the article, uh, basically, the prep, the uh, take on? Were they, were they, they went retrospectively reviewed patients over the course, like, like you know, okay, 20, 20, uh, 20 years? You can right. just read it if you want, but go ahead. 400, uh, 400 procedures. But what they did is they, they went back to look at these x rays to see what the rate of adjacent segment disease was in the patients that underwent ACDF. And what they found, and it's important, but the important number to take away from this paper is they found a 2.9 per year incidence of the adjacent segment disease. Um, so if you if you march that out over the course of 10 years, and this is what's important to talk to, talk to your patients about, is 25 to 30 percent. Uh, 25 to 30 percent will have an adjacent segment disease at 10 years. And a lot of these patients, this patient's, I think you said it's 55 years. So it's important to counsel them that. This is not a one necessarily a one and done. There's still a, a greater than a greater than zero chance, like a good chance that they may develop a, an adjacent second disease over the course of their lifetime requiring a second surgery. Yeah, those, those are good points. So, uh, so fusions. I'm going to add one thing to that. So been, that, that is a, uh, a landmark hallmark uh, study. It's a number that we quote to our patients all the time 25% uh, chance of adjacent second surgery at 10 years. But there have been other follow-up studies that try to parse this even further to say why is it that it's those 25 percent cases that uh, that undergo revision surgery and there's the 75 that don't are there issues that uh that differentiate one group from the other and uh and there's one important technical issue with performing the procedure uh, that is a uh, predictor anybody have any ideas look at the bottom right x-ray Anybody know? Plate yeah. is too long. So you want to keep those screws and the plate as far away from the normal non-operated segment as possible. You want to go at least half, no more than half of the vertebral body. And actually, that was in my recertification exam. A guy asked me that question. It's Dan Rude. Dan Rude did that study. <laughs> but, but but also, C5, C6 is the highest risk. But people still deteriorate. So you you can have a C5, C6 disc herniation, and the same patient never had surgery, comes back five years, ten years later. And so the disease can't progress. So the question is, is it natural disease progression versus a postoperative complication? You know what I mean? And I don't think, no, I mean, no one knows for sure. One of my questions about this is this is already a patient. You already looked at It's a retrospective. So it's already a patient population that has developed cervical, like a cervical disc herniation. Uh, and to say that there's there could be some sort of like not necessarily genetic, but also like predisposed predisposed yeah. conditions. Natural course of disease, yeah. Like is it everybody or is it these people who have already shown themselves as prone to cervical pathology then develop? I mean it's kind of it, it kind of turns it around about logic that I mean, well at the end of the day, these are the people you're operating on, you need to counsel them anyway, but 
let me give you another example though of why this makes uh, of the if you don't operate on patients if you see a patient who has a degenerative spinal seizures in the spine where is it usually what level do they typically have or, or, uh, in the lumbar spine cervical oh, cervical spine it's usually like mid lower c5 c6 c6 c7 Four, Anybody five, else? Hmm? Four, five. C four five. I don't think I've ever seen the genus spinal load five six or six seven. It's almost always at C four five in a patient who's never had prior surgery. And it's because the natural history is the generation of five six and six seven. It's that older person who whose spine stiffens up, and then the C four five they come to you with the degenerative spinal load. So that's again evidence that as the spine stiffens, the adjacent levels will will wear out. Okay, so uh, so artificial disc replacement um, is another surgical option here, like a whole bunch of them. Um, and uh, who's going to do the uh, Swedish uh, spine register? Okay. Um, so this is a 2019 article published in the Journal of Neurosurgery by McDowell et al. from Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, it's a retrospective database study, including patients with cervical degenerative disc disease and radiculopathy. Um, and it was comparing uh, artificial disc replacement surgery to anterior cervical uh, discectomy infusion, uh, ACDF. Uh, the hypothesis here is that, as we talked about, fusion at a spinal level can cause adjacent, uh, adjacent level spinal disease. And the theory is that artificial disc replacement uh, will avoid progression of, di of disease to an adjacent level. Um, so ACDF is a gold standard being compared to a test group of artificial disc replacement. Uh, the primary outcomes of this study was uh, neck disability index. Uh, other patient reported outcomes included EQ5D and VAS scores. Uh, they also let, me, let me just interrupt one thing. So the registry in Sweden, Sweden is a country of 10 million people. Uh, and it uh, started in 93, and we just started, the United States just started a registry, and I, was, I emailed, uh, you just saw my email, and uh, it started in March, and it's it's uh, both AAOS and AANS, uh, it costs 5,000 bucks, and we have to put the data in, but I mean, it's really interesting, because then you can mine all this data, all right, okay, so I just wanted to make another comment, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so primary outcome was neck disability index, secondary PROs included EQ5D and VAS scores. Uh, they also compared adverse event rates and reoperation rates. Uh, Five-year outcomes were assessed using ANOVA and a Kaplan-Meier plot was used to analyze time to revision surgery. Uh, results, there were uh, 3,794 patients treated with ACDF, um, with 204 patients treated with artificial disc replacement. Uh, table two in the study shows that uh, the patient reported outcomes improved in each group uh, across all three patient reported outcomes. There is no statistically significant difference uh, comparing the two uh, cohorts and how much they improved with these PROs. Uh, table three shows uh, the complication rates. So interestingly here, uh, the, the point of the artificial disc replacement is to uh, avoid fusion, avoid progression of uh, pathology to the adjacent level. Uh, secondary surgery at the adjacent level was the same in these two groups at 1.5%, um, although the uh, total number of perioperative complications and the secondary, survey, uh, secondary surgeries at the uh, index level uh, were higher in the artificial disc replacement group. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't seem that artificial disc replacement uh, prevented any progression of clinical adjacent spinal level pathology. Um, or at least not in the uh, in the outcome of revision surgery. Uh, so I, I suppose that hypothesis was. Uh, so the whole point of artificial discs is uh, uh, artificial discs prevent adjacent segment progression because you have range of motion, right? right? So the next level doesn't go bad because the motion is preserved, right? Hypothetically, yes. That's the point. Yes. Um, okay. But the results of the study showed that uh, revision surgery. Uh, at the adjacent level was equal in these two groups of fusion versus artificial disc replacement. Yeah, um, and there was a higher um, complication rate. Yes. Okay. Um, so here's the neck disability index um, that they used, and they were the same. The patients said about the same. So any any other comments on that uh, article? It was My interesting. Only comment is the question is what what artificial disc was used. And uh, uh, okay, the artif I'll answer the question quickly. It was it was a, this is a, a registry, 
So uh, many many artificial right, discs. Right. So basically, the ones and they and they Early actually generation artificial discs. Um, and I'll they were they weren't early actually. They were, they were all they were all of them. I'll, I'll, I'll read them actually. Okay, was, okay, okay. I know. I, it was a big mix. Right. I will tell you that because uh, I believe in the surgery that that this data is contrary to what the data has been for the disc artificial discs that were have been released such as Secure Disc, uh, Secure C, the Mobi C, which the FDA has given superiority, one of the few devices that you'll see in orthopedics where superiority over the cohort, which was ACDF. And that's, in the, that's, that's what was given. And if you look at seven-year data of comparing the same studies, there's clearly be, uh, an increasing difference between the, the, the incidence of adjacent segment degeneration uh, in that artificial disc have uh, less. Okay, so this data is, is being still being looked at, but this is contrary to what these articles say. That holds true for the uh, brown disc as well. So, uh, so um, there are other there's there's those other data out there, and I, they, we we were one of the IDE sites for the artificial disc about 15 years ago, seriously. <laughs> and, um, and I can tell you, the, I had the, like 12 or 15 patients we did as part of our group, and not one of them has been revised. Not one of them has come back for adjacent segment surgery. So this, in this... Uh, oh, sorry, and one, one more issue I have to the paper is this, the, they had, like they, the number of patients they had in the, uh, the artificial disc started at just 200, and they had significant dropout of up to 40% at just in five years, which makes you kind of question the validity of their results. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. At five years. 150, 150 artificial discs at five years, and I don't know how you can really make sure you're powered enough to test no difference. It's two, it were 200, around 200 discs, and the most common was, was Discovery from Depew, 24. Which is not even available now, so I'm not even sure what it was made of, Discovery. Right. Brian was 18, and then ProDisc 18. There were seven secures. So it was like a mixed bag. Okay, let's, uh, next article, um, Katie. Can you sit yeah. here? So, okay. Uh, so this is this article is similar in concept to all the background of saying that ACDF was the gold standard to which um, uh, the artificial disc replacement and cervical spine was compared. Again, it's five-year outcomes, but this time basically the same group elected to do a randomized control trial. Um, they were able to um, obtain a cohort of um, about 153 patients that were split between, almost equally between men and women. Um, their primary outcomes for the surgery or for the, the study, uh, again, NDI scores, um, secondary outcomes at EQ5D. Um, and then they also um, took it a little further and they um, included radiographic um, outcomes as well. They took uh, x rays, flexion extension um, at the post op visit in order to uh, determine preservation of range of motion um, and, and fusion. They also looked for both clinical um, adjacent segment degeneration um, as well as the um, uh, as well as radiographic well on MRI they looked for signs of adjacent segment degeneration on MRI um, and what they were able to show um, but again, this is the most important thing this is a randomized yes, it's randomized control. control so they, they took the disc out and then the surgeon was handed an envelope it says you're going to do a fusion or you're going to do an artificial disc yep. But again, the disc was uh, was the Discover disc, which is not even on the market right now. Okay, so this is kind of a, it's, it's it's an interesting study. Okay, and they followed the MRI five years later. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, and they actually had a decent patient retention. It seems like um, probably because it was a Swedish study. But anyway, it was pretty high. It was like 88 percent or something. Yes. Yes. Something very good. Um, so at um, five years, they were actually um, not able to show a clinically significant. Um, difference between um, the disc replacement and the um, and the anterior uh, fusion. So basically, they their primary their most startling outcome to me, I guess, is that um, the ADRs were spontaneously fusing over time. About twenty five percent of them did do that. Um, but talking, uh, Clunk and I were talking earlier today that um, it's like a, it's a progressive fusion, and ultimately that would 
show that the so it looked it looked like to each other. It looked like this. So a twenty a quarter a quarter of them fused. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a quarter of them slow. fused. Huh? Yes. You call it a slow motion. So. <laughs> um, and then the um, I actually have a question about that after we're done. Uh, but anyway, and some ACDS take years too, right? So it's interesting. All right, keep going. And then also the um, so secondary surgery was a major outcome for these folks. Um, and so the about twenty one percent of patients with disc replacement ended up with a reoperation, and seven patients with a fusion. So. Um, and that was a p-value of 0.11, so not technically clinically significant, but notable. Um, so, the, I mean, the, the failures for the disc replacement were primarily because of implant loosening or just failure of the implant itself, which maybe is attributable to the fact that the implant may not have been good enough to be used clinically, and that's why it's not on the market right now. Um, so these are the failures, uh, they're double the failures in women, and it was from loosening a mm -hmm. substance. That was like the major, so they they also said maybe it was osteoporosis, just because women failed worse than men. And would you attribute that to just the preparation of the implant or the implant, the implant itself? Do you think that they were too aggressive preparing the implant in women? Well, that, that would increase subsidence, certainly, if right. you violate the implant. I was just curious if, well, I don't know. Early on, that might have contributed as people were getting used to doing these a little bit more. No, they were that. That was that was addressed in the articles. These were experienced surgeons, so they don't think that that but it was a learning technique. curve. Okay. But they they that's what they said, and they may be lying, but <laughs> that's what they said in the article. Um, so basically, um, they were not able to show a a significant difference when you look at the intention of the this replacement to preserve motion, the fact that people were not only reoperated on, but also were experiencing fusion with their um, disc replacements, which I wanted to ask about, are people like symptomatic like at pseudoarthrosis when that's happening, or is it just that it's fusing in the same way that an ACDF would, like a, a like a slow fusion, like Dr. Lemos uh, was what, what's the question? What's the question? My question is, are people symptomatic from their, um, if they're fusing around a disc replacement, are they symptomatic in the same way that like someone with a pseudoarthrosis that would never fuse would be versus if someone was having a slow lip like Dr. That's Dick. an interesting question. I was just curious if they were symptomatic. You know, I, I think it depends on patient selection. I, I look at the artificial disc. If you look at the spectrum of degeneration, okay, you have the younger patients that have the herniated disc, and you have the older patients who have the osteophytic stenosis. I think the key thing about these studies that were done, the industry supported studies for submitting to FDA, were that they were done on patients who had primarily radiculopathy. Similar to a patient in a lumbar spine who has a herniated disc with sciatica, you don't fuse those patients. You'll do you'll take the disc herniation out. So if you take that patient population, you do a discectomy and you put an artificial disc in, that is different than putting it in for people with neck pain who may have facet arthrosis. That you know, so so I, I think that the question is what were the criteria for for doing this artificial disc? I look at it's it's an early stage or early you know in the degenerative process procedure, and I don't do it in patients that and less than fifty percent collapse the disc space. That was one of the criteria for for the the study. You have the more than fifty percent disc height. It's a, it's purely radiculopathy with very little neck pain. Those are the patients that they studied. She's asking, I think she's asking a different question. She's well, asking, but she got a question about pain. So the pain why do not is neck turn? pain. Why do not need to Well, because that. if they're usually moving up the degenerative there's segment, there's most there's patients there. you do surgery on that have pain, I think, their, their radical pain goes away, it's neck pain. Mm -hmm. So is the, are, are those the patients that are more the spondylitic pain that are still having movement of a, of a painful joint? Mm -hmm. You know, if their radicular pain goes away, but they still have neck pain, the question is what pain are they having? They're not having persistent arm pain typically. Pseudoarthrosis, you don't have arm pain typically, you have neck pain. I think it's movement of a, of a symptomatic degenerative joint that you wanted to fuse in the first place. That's why if you do a disc replacement, a patient doesn't have that axial component, they're more likely to be fine uh, and, and, and do well and, and, and 
the studies are showing in seven years, they're not getting surgery. They have much less <clears throat> incidence of surgery at that level with the latest technology compared to if they have an ACDF and, you know, they go on to sore arthrosis and such. But they still showed, I think in here they showed um, at least radiographic progression of set arthritis too. So in the disc replacement group, I think. Which is quite natural. You would think right, so yeah, says. they couldn't say whether or not it was, but if you maintain the motion there, then you may be symptomatic somewhere else. The other, the other interesting thing is that the disc replacement people um, were more normal uh, post-op MRI than the ACDFs at the next level, which is sort of mild evidence that they work. But I, my, my opinion, tell me if it's just total BS. When people have a non-union, okay, I think it's because pain fiber, the, the afferent's got to come from somewhere. Like, you have to have an afferent. It comes from... Uh, nerve like P fibers or nerve fibers growing into the non-union, abnormal motion, and people register it as pain. That's that's what I think. So I think her question, Katie's question, is very valid. Let's say someone is going on to fuse, um, but it's not fused. Can that give radiculopathy from uh, pain? I mean, I think it's an interesting question. Or even just neck pain. Like yeah, and neck pain. Yeah. yeah. I haven't. You know, I haven't seen that personally. I had patients go on to do auto fuse. And some of the couple of patients who we did the artificial disc on did get a fusion eventually, but I don't recall them getting pain during that process. A lot of times you'll see ossification of the anterior longitudinal ligament, like you saw on one of those images, but you do flexion, extension, and there's still a lot of motion there. But but it looks so, so maybe 10 years later that'll go on and fuse, auto fuse. But, um, but that doesn't tend to hurt people when they have. It doesn't tend to hurt patients, right? I haven't had to fuse any of those patients because they were symptomatic because they had leg pain. I've only revised two artificial discs. One of them was a patient who I put it in for workers' comp for mostly neck and arm pain, bad choice, and had to, who ultimately fused her. And another one that the thing had slipped out of position it was a different device. But I haven't had to revise any of my over the years since this has been released. I don't know about you, but I've revised in your, have you revised many cervical brine? I mean, you use a brine device. One, one. And, um, and I'll, I'll just say this, that keep in mind that um, when we had the slow lift process, and mine was a slow lift, and I had to revise, um, the, the device, the artificial disc that's in there is a motion device. Mm -hmm. So it's supposed to move. So it'll just move less and less, as opposed to a fusion. Uh, it's not a motion device that's in there, regardless of what you, if you've got allograft, it might resorb. You know, if it is a piece of a peak, that means it's wiggling around in there. So it's not meant to move. So uh, not, you know, I think, Spiro, I think that's a, a, a good uh, theory in terms of what's causing the pain. But I think at the, at the root, you have to understand one is a motion device mm -hmm. and designed that way. So it's okay if it moves and it'll just move less and less. And maybe the, the patient will you know, perceive a little bit of stiffness, usually not because it happens over such a long period of time. And the other is not a motion device. It's not designed that way. The plate is not, and so something is going to fail. The plate will fail, the screws will fail, the implant will fail, something like that. Uh, you, the one device, uh, one uh, case of all that I uh, revised was uh, a gentleman that I did um, uh, an artificial disc on, uh, came back somewhere between five to ten years later with radiculopathy. And he had gone on to fuse, we got a CAT scan, and he had a ton of bone in his foramen. So I had to take him back and do a foramen on him. So he developed an osteophyte, basically. He developed an osteophyte, yeah. But he was solid. You can see a sheet of bone where the, uh, uh, along, along the ventral aspect of the implant. Okay. Um, all right, so any um, any questions about these uh, articles? I mean, I, I, and I picked these articles because they were not industry-sponsored. No offense to industry who's in the room. So any other comments or questions? Okay, so uh, I just did the boring thing in ACDF on this patient. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, Dr. Hanna, I did have a question. So for, um, for a patient that has that sort of caudally migrating fragment, would you be more tempted to go in with a plan to do an ACDF? Because if you can't do that piece, you might have to consider maybe violating a little bit more of the end and therefore you're safer doing that ACP, right? Do that ACDF. Uh, Brian, just give one second. Let me just turn this off. One second.
I think I turned it off.